Well, look at you, sir. Pedro Pascal. No, look at you. Look at you, Clayton man. Davis. Listen, uh, <laughs> very happy to be with you today. I'm happy I'm, to be here. I'm very happy for this Pedro movement. Somebody it, stop me. It's infectious. Everyone loves you. You're having... Uh, I won't say a great year, a great decade. I don't. I don't know how you how you describe it yourself. What do you, What do you? How are you describing this time period? I can view it in really, really practical terms. In terms of what happened after I got Game of Thrones, mm. which was what felt like a really lucky circumstance, and the break that 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 felt like it changed things um, as far as previous work that were big breaks to me because it meant being able to pay rent and continue. You know what I mean? Paying bills is important. Yeah, super <laughs> important. And um uh, and 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 so, you know, this seven episode arc on the fourth season of Game of Thrones that David Benioff and Dan Weiss were willing to take a chance on as far as an actor who was unknown by comparison. It hasn't been the same for me since. Yeah, um, I, so it really is that that so that you, role, that Thrones. job, no shit. And then uh, HBO said we're gonna keep you in the family, right? Yeah, for a little bit. Yeah, The Last of Us. Yeah. Uh, jumping ahead. I'm gonna jump. I'm gonna jump ahead because listen, we have so much to talk about. You are uh, sitting with the awards editor at Variety, uh, and I am calling you an Emmy contender. And I, my opinion is all that matters in this uh, landscape of television awards. I just want you to know that. Oh, that's why yeah. I'm here. That's why you're here. <laughs> um, were you ever reluctant to take Last of Us? Because some of us still have PTSD from The Walking Dead. And yeah. uh, that not going as well as we had hoped it would go. You mean from the start of The Walking Dead yeah, and how like impressive the, the zombie standpoint? Like, you know, it's, right. there's an oversaturation of zombie stuff. Right well, now. can we just talk for a second about where it feels like it started and re was reinvigorated? Yes. What's your opinion? Which, which do you, which, which movie do you think kind of reignited the zombie genre? Uh, I mean, this is a test. I know. I mean, it was definitely pre World War Z. But I, I get. I mean, like I, Dawn of the Dead. I guess. Like, no. <laughs> Go ahead. I want. W w what would you? What would you call? Twenty eight days later. Mm. Twenty eight days later. Even though it's a rage virus, but still was sort of like the conversation about zombies. And I don't know how much of a hit that movie was, but it's I saw a it. Also. <laughs> it's also a masterpiece. Yeah. I saw it in the movie theater, and I had, um, like, you know that kind of experience as a grown adult where something gets kind of into the fabric fabric of your skin and 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 I had nightmares but they were kind of adventure nightmares and I um I remember that thrill seeking experience like being on a ride but also pretty sophisticated material. I'm going to turn this entire podcast into talking about 28 yeah, Days Later. It's, good. it's, it's our spinoff. Go ahead. <laughs> um, but anyway, I, I, I recognize I, I've loved keeping track of everything that happened after 28 Days Later um, because then – I was really surprised by Dawn of the Dead. I thought it was really good and had one of the best openings of a horror movie I'd seen in a really long time. Um, anticipated very much the uh, uh, the start of The Walking Dead, um, and uh, I guess I I guess I really liked the the genre and um, also felt the oversaturation. Mm -hmm. uh, so much so that I kind of started forgetting about the genre a little bit. And um, then the, uh, the Last of Us came along, which inserted itself very spontaneously into my life, it, where I thought that I would be doing something else for the next couple of years. Within that, there was just like a, a, a small window of opportunity where I got a phone call and was asked to look at these scripts by Craig Mazin. And I was like, the guy who wrote Chernobyl? And, and they said yes. And um, if it hadn't been Craig, I think I wouldn't have 
looked at them, not to say, um, I just didn't feel like psychologically reconstructing the future or taking the shine off of what I was planning to do anyway. Do you know what I mean? And, um, and I was really kind of reluctant from changing the energy up in terms of what I was already planning on, on, on doing, but it was Craig Mason because I hadn't heard of the last of us. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't know about the game. And, um, Cause I'm old. No, I mean, just because you're not a gamer, right? I'm, I'm, I'm like, I, my game days are kind of behind me, and now it's just yeah. FIFA. I think <laughs> that I, <laughs> I think that I, uh, 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 no, I guess I'm not a gamer in that I don't have the skill with the, the, the console. What are yeah. they called? Uh, game controllers. Yeah, game yeah, controllers. Yeah. So you can't play Mortal Kombat or anything like that. I, I was good at like um, Super Mario Brothers late '80s. Punch out um, that stuff. You're and, touching my heart. Right and now, even right? earlier, like we didn't even have Atari. We had ColecoVision, which mm-hmm. I think was like the 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 D version of Atari. Yeah. And uh, it was Mousetrap and uh, Frogger, all that stuff. And um, and arcades in the cinemas, you know. Uh, and so a, a big gamer in that regard, from like the original, you know, Tron and stuff like that. But. Uh, not the more sophisticated, you need to be talented and you need to have Do this. <laughs> actual, you know, skill. Back to when I got a call and was asked to look at these scripts and if I liked them, the writer, Craig Mazin, would like to jump on a Zoom with you. And, um, and so after reading, they, they sent me the first three scripts. And um, I, I, I think that... Uh, as it was expressed in the pilot that was aired, it starts in a very kind of intimate way. And it gradually forces you into a very world building story. But it is so smartly through the perspective of the character Sarah played by Nico Parker. And, um, and that was, immediately engaging to me just as a reader like it got me it entertained me right away and that's always like a good sign because if the part is good but the whole thing is like like if the part is attractive let's say because if it isn't good then the part can't really be good but it can still be attractive lead type of character um I find that it works better for my brain if I like it as a as a as a reader or as an audience member, you know. And I find it like, oh, I want to see this. You know what I mean? And uh, so I noticed that right away, and met with um, and and met with Craig, and hadn't even got a chance, hadn't even had the chance to finish the first three episodes yet, and. Um, and then, and then talked with Craig and had an instant chemistry with him and then kind of felt the draw of working with somebody that I was going to get along with really well. And I know how to get along with everybody. Yeah. You know what I mean? But it doesn't yeah. mean I like everybody. Yeah. yeah. No, no. <laughs> okay. No, no, we're all going to wonder. But all right. No. But- <laughs> I don't get it. Not you know yeah. professional like you know you, you at can the, make it, at the grocery store yeah. <laughs> at a job yeah. you know what I mean um, or it isn't you know what that like is too provocative uh, n- like or not like is too provocative way of a put it. it it doesn't mean that I'm feel comfortable or myself with everybody do you know what I mean not like right now. Where you're just coming alive. I like you very much. Yeah, I like you too. <laughs> um, I have no problem yeah. admitting that. I, I actually have a, I have a follow-up question about it because one thing that I love so much about you and and Joel, the character, is one of my big things I write about here is diversity in film, television. I want to see it. I'm a Latino black man in journalism. Not very many of us are yeah. here. Yeah. Um, you are the goal that I want to see, because when we talk about diversity, we all seem to be talking about different things. You're a Latino in a leading role, but 
it Joel doesn't have to be Latino. Joel could be anybody. And that's where I get really excited. It's yeah. like you you're there, you're representing, you're you're doing some great things and you can just be you don't have to be like overly Latino. You can just be Pedro Pascal playing Joel. And when that uh and how that translates to the Emmy race, you may not be aware of this. Um 75 years of Emmy history, one Latino has been nominated for lead actor drama. That's Jimmy Smith. Jimmy Smith. He didn't so win? He didn't win for NYPD Blue. Not lead, not during NYPD, that time. I guest starred on NYPD Blue. No, you did. Did you really? Oh, hell yeah, I did. We win. We did. Uh, that would have been 1990. Uh, it would have aired. To, no, I, I shot it in 2000. Really? Yeah. Well, life comes full circle now. So <laughs> yeah. I feel like I'm looking at potentially number two and three that's out there, like Diego Luna's and Andor. There's so yeah. – they're like I don't have to just like put all my eggs in one basket. There's right. a lot of baskets here. Do you feel – crazy. Do you feel that wave coming that you can just be Pedro Pascal an actor versus Pedro Pascal, like the Latino guy that we have for Latino roles? Uh, you know, And we love you like on Narcos and everything like that, but yeah. do you feel that that change right now? I think that the change is really important and that the best way um, to continue representation is exactly as you put it, just casting a person into a role that isn't limited to opening the 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 not limiting to a character to its uh racial identity you know especially if it's an ip that we're familiar with or a book and people get so butthurt about this kind of stuff but um who cares because that is the coolest way of like moving the needle is um being open about the casting in every way you know, I remember looking at a script and thinking, God, wouldn't it be so? And there was this real sort of scary parental figure and it was written as a father in it. And, and then I thought, God, wouldn't it be interesting if it was a mother? Like if it was, you know, Diane Weiss instead of, you know, and sort of treating um, uh, the approach with some originality and let that originality be inclusive. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, you... you, you Instead you, of being like, mind. this, these are the instructions, this is how we need to follow it, um, this is the way, this is, um, let's label what representation is and follow those. No, that, I, I think that that, I think that we need to continue discovering it and, 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 um, and making sure that we understand that representation is in service of telling the story yeah. instead of fulfilling um, a political frustration, you know, which is totally legit yeah. also. Um, it's very funny. It's a very interesting thing, I think, to navigate, and I think that it deserves all the attention in the world so that we do navigate it and that, we, and that, the, and that the needle does move and that things do kind of, like, change. And yeah. It's awesome. Glad to hear that. Thank, <laughs> thank you, Pedro. You're welcome. Uh, um, so I, I need to ask about uh, season two of Last of Us that uh, right now is not happening because time of recording. We are uh, in the middle of a writer's strike. Yeah. And I know you're not a gamer, but I'm sure you're hyper aware of what happens in Last of Us 2, the video game, yeah. to Joel. Um, this isn't a spoiler alert because uh, video games, I think, are a different animal. But we lose Joel. And we, we lose him. He, what? He is killed. What? Horribly killed. What? In, in In game two. What are you talking yeah, I know. And, and and it also time jumps also uh, in, in the future. Do you, because it's such a catalyst for what happens and the and the show has really close, semi-closely followed that. Um, do you know if we're going to explore that five-year gap or are we going to go right into Last of Us video game part two mode? I, I need to prepare myself if I'm going to lose you. 
very early on in <laughs> Last of Us season two. That's I'll, what I'm asking. I'll always be with you. <laughs> yes. No one is ever gone. <sighs> I want to. I'm misquoting. Uh, Star Wars. <laughs> no, I, I'm misquoting Tony Morrison, <laughs> which is terrible. Yeah. It's a, there's a version um, of that everywhere. No one has ever lost or uh, 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 anyway. Um, I actually don't know. And here's the thing. I think that they, if you think about the kind of uh, construct of a show, especially um, as it begins and not knowing whether or not it'll do well or great, or not, you know, they, um, they marry themselves very much to the adaptation of, uh, the first game, for example. And I remember back to Narcos, for example, people feeling frustrated that they lose Pablo Escobar as soon as they did, but they already had an outline with the first two seasons and they ended the first season with Pablo Escobar's escape from prison, not knowing that the world would fall madly in love with Wagner Mauda, mm. not necessarily with Pablo Escobar, mm-hmm. but with Wagner Mauda and yeah. his performance. Yeah. But then they only had a certain amount of months left of the character's life from where they ended the first season. If they had known, um, so who knows in terms of if they could guarantee the success of the show if they would have teased out the first season more. But I think that would be a mistake because ultimately um, there is, uh, they are in service of um, uh, an IP that uh, works really well and are finding very unexpected ways to expand on it. And that being said, I think that part two has more leeway I think it seemed to me as far as the people that I talked to that it's a different immersive experience and while there are things that have to happen for the central narrative to occur um, it it seems like it's a little bit more uh, uh, open Um, so that means I don't fucking know (laughs) How or, they're, or I, you're how they're a gonna, really good liar. How they're going to do it. Yeah. Um, will you be bummed? No, I think would, I should know. Would, would you be bummed? And they haven't... Would uh, you be bummed if you died early on in season two? Not if it's good. Okay. You know? Do you know how the character dies I love the, in the video game? good television. Move on. Okay, fine. All right. Uh, I'm gonna, She's Louise. I just wanted you to answer. Maybe they're gonna. Maybe they're gonna. Maybe they're gonna do it. Maybe they're not gonna do it. Okay. You haven't seen the world, so you don't know. You keep going for family. Let's go to Mandalorian. The helmet, the man under the helmet. It really did explore some new territory this year. And Star Wars continues to be a very interesting world-building experience. Um, what uh, I, I spoke about it uh, recently that uh, your co-star um, will be campaigning lead actress this year for the show because the show really centered around her character uh, around Katie. Right. Yeah. yeah. I just said her name, right? Yeah. yeah. You know, you know her. That, oh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. 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 That one. What was it like, uh, this season? Because it really, uh, put a focus on, on her and I guess where we can go from here. I think it was great in that it also comes into a full realization of a beloved character that is from the world of Dave Filoni. Mm-hmm. And, you know, Bo-Katan, because Din Djarin is a creation that starts with combining the worlds of uh, Star Wars, Jon Favreau, and Dave Filoni, yeah. and introducing this character uh, through the live-action show, The Mandalorian, and then creating the opportunities of pulling references and, um, and live-action characters from his, uh, Dave Filoni's beloved animated series. And so, sure, we, everyone gets to kind of experience the excitement of the character being introduced. Mm-hmm. 
and she's a badass and um it's perfect casting and i am a big battlestar galactica fanboy really? yeah big time uh i own the dvds <laughs> I'm I'm a, I'm a, I'm I'm happy you own physical media. Physical there, media forever, right? forever. Thank you. I still can't think of anything that has a better intro than Battlestar Galactica every episode. Yeah. Just the thrill of the drum beat <laughs> and being showing you what was going to happen in the yeah. episode but still throwing Not. your scent off of what was going to happen in the episode. And um and and so I remember Dave talking to me about the possibility of casting the voice actor uh uh, of Bo Katan in the live action role. And I was like, Davy Sackhoff, you have to do it. And so, anyway, I just think it was perfect that we get to meet and see the character, and she gets to do cool shit in the second season, and then take center stage in the third. And um, it's what I would want for. Uh, the character and for and and as a fan of um uh the clone wars your cult fractured our people where were you then this this year the fans were uh denied my face your face this season have a definitely a more vocal voice performance more than anything else is does does that operate differently for you versus like any other time uh during the seasons the previous seasons it's been such an interesting experiment throughout in that um there was limited time for me on set in the first season um and uh uh and and kind of a, a collaborative process of creating and establishing a physical presence that was like based on um, uh, what they needed for the character, what the costume, what the silhouette is, um, what you know, uh, what Brendan Wayne can do, um, what Latif Crowder can do, and um, and 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 what was important to. Uh, John and Dave and me, as far as a, a physical language was concerned, and then stepping into it for the majority of season two, um, because I wanted to, and I wanted to um, sort of uh, see how far little could go. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and it, and it was really cool, but the the the, but very hard, you know, and um, very physically demanding in a way that, number one, the show needs to get shot, mm -hmm. and there are so many uh, departments and elements that go into creating the visual experience of that show, yeah. and so, so many bodies, uh, and um, and and it didn't seem you know, true to be concerned with um, Din Djarin's face and being really economical if it was going to get done than for it to have the most amount of impact. Yeah. There was actually a version of an episode in season two where he takes his helmet off in the beginning of the episode and is in a different kind of a costume. And, um, and, and, uh, and then, and we had a conversation and we like, and I was like, I think we should hold it. And they're like, what are you, are you crazy? And I was like, no, <laughs> I really think that, that, that it, 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 it should come when the stakes feel the highest, you know? And, um, and look, that's not, I'm not the outlier of the universe who doesn't care about, you know, my face or, or, uh, but it, it didn't, I would, I would much rather the show work than, um, betray it to any kind of like, you know, 
human need to be seen because the show was presented to me as the Mandalorian and all of its like uh, visual uh, uh, identity. At that point, there was so much experience for everyone involved in terms of authoring this character that um, that it was I able to become mostly a voiceover gig for season three um, uh, for the most part and um, and and always maintain what the initial experience was which is very very surgical post work um, in terms of the writing the dialogue the tone even stuff I was on set for being able to kind of like review that again, hear how it sounds. It's unbelievable how well they pick up. Yeah. There's a mic pack like, you know, In packed into the helmet. And um, being able to, um, being able to, again, reauthor, be like, let me make this sound a little more intense. Um, and in, in such a surgical, tiny way. And so, yeah, it was, it's, it's been, it, it, it's, it's harder work than you think. And it, and, and and more fun than you would expect as well. I can get a little uh, granular, yeah. you know? Uh, I, my brain can get a little, and so it's been a great opportunity, and John Favreau has always like really been um, so collaborative, especially in that process of it. But just a quick shout out to Disney and Star Wars peeps, because you're, this season, I don't know, again, inside baseball, people, regular people may not see, uh, Crowder and Brendan are credited yeah. in the opening credits. Like yeah. that is, we we fight for stunt people to get their recognition all Absolutely. the time, and Absolutely. it's good to see see their names on there. Awesome. Uh, I know we have a. Uh, I don't want to keep you all day, even I do want to keep you all day. Um, Strange way of life. Yeah, because you are a film guy as well, and I. My philosophy is you are only a great actor if you have a good. Oscar snub under your belt, and you do because I believe you should have been nominated for the unbearable weight oh, of massive talent last year. It, it, you can read the article where I say where is Pedro's nomination. Oh man! And now you're going to team up with my uh, other favorite guy, Ethan Hawke. Yep. Uh, and you know this up and coming director, also named Pedro. Right. Talk about strange way of life and filming that with. Pedro, that's a short and really should be a feature film that's three hours long. Oh, man. Oh. Yeah. There you go. Has Pedro ever made a three-hour movie? He wouldn't dare. I don't think so. No, because he respects my time. Exactly. <laughs> and people's uh, lower back issues. Um, you know, I saw Women on the Verge of a Nervous Breakdown in the movie theater, uh, Balboa Peninsula, Orange County, California, with my whole family. And um, it really was the kind of thing that changes your DNA. DNA, exactly. When you see that level of color, that kind of comedy, that kind of um, uh, uh, s- s- sexual atmosphere of every kind with every facet of um, dangerous, functional, tragic, you know, um, a kind of circus of energy and also homaging all of um, very specific uh, classic cinema and uh, theater. And I seem to, at a very young age, be able to absorb all of that. And thereafter, uh, Pedro being a favorite of my family's um, didn't miss anything that he made after that. And so it was a dream to meet him, number one. He actually reached out to me and when I was doing King Lear, I was playing Edmund in a Broadway production of King Lear that Glenda Jackson was, was, was the king. And he had reached out and was very curious about the production and wanted to come and see it. And he was like, how long is it? I said, it's three hours and 45 minutes. And he was like, I bet it all. <laughs> Ay, Pedro, no, no te preocupes, por favor, you know. Uh, he's like, maybe we meet for coffee instead. <laughs> and um, and was kind enough and had nothing in mind for me at all. Really? Simply just uh, uh, people in common and was a, 
aware about how vocal I was in terms of um, my admiration for him. So very, very generously uh, reached out, um, got together for uh, some coffee and just chatted away and uh, established a connection and a relationship. And then a couple of years later, he, um, he reached out. I, I hadn't even seen Pain and Glory uh, it, when I when I when I sat down with him the first time, uh, I don't think it had come out yet. Do you even know that Antonio Banderas was about to get an Oscar nomination? They were not aware. Look at that. For me, that was the performance of the year. It was you it was know great. there were incredible performances all around uh, that year, but um, I wasn't surprised by what Antonio Banderas did, but I was still floored because he's always turned it out and everything but it was still kind of um something so moving in that he seemed to come up with an interpretation that was not um what do you call it mimicking is too patronizing of a word but basically uh you know playing Pedro but it was almost like playing Pedro's soul in a way and a person that he has known personally and professionally for so many decades, I just haven't seen anything like that. I haven't seen that kind of authorship in a performance where there are so many layers of doing it. You can come up with, you can study a person physically, but it wasn't that. It was more like, I understand you and am going to do that, but anyway. Uh, I remember that just moved me so much. But um, then a couple of years after I sat down with Bether in New York, he called me on Christmas Eve and said that he had a short film that he, that he, that he wanted to do with me. And, um, and I said, Merry Christmas. And he was like, <laughs> he's like, yeah, no, I, is it Christmas? I don't, I don't, I don't do, I don't, I don't, I don't do holidays. And I was like, I'm with you. I'm home alone, like hiding from the world. Oh no! Can you come to my house for Christmas? I'm yeah, gonna, gonna absolutely. You can come to my. My wife is the best cook I know. There was another wave. There was another Los Angeles wave. This was a Christmas, uh, twenty twenty one probably twenty one into twenty two. Yeah, remember when, it, when we, we were had like another thinking, wave during was, the holidays? Yeah, it was like right before BAFTA, and everyone got like COVID. Yeah, then. yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then you know the conversation started there, and uh, I was shooting The Last of Us at the time. And, uh, and, and I think that it's fascinating to see him get his feet wet with, uh, English language because it's, uh, um, there are cultural identities that can sort of, um, uh, uh, marry themselves a little bit more with identities outside of their culture, if that makes any sense. And Spain, I would not say is one of them. <laughs> You know, it's 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 a very very firm identity, yeah. um, as far as uh, 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 cinema is concerned, and uh, and and so it's it's so beautiful to see Pedro as the artist that he is to kind of be like, I'm not gonna. God knows how many offers from Hollywood he turned down mm -hmm. after uh, Women on the Verge yeah. or Law of Desire or any of the things that started to emerge in his sort of career of the yeah. 80s. I suppose you talked to her like when he won the Oscar for that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Honestly, I can't even imagine the amount of time, the amount of times he was asked to kind of come in and do a feature, um, all of which he said no to. And to meet somebody who is uncompromising in terms of what their process is because it isn't um, a standard, but it's just being true to themselves. You know, I don't, I can't, um, un I can't understand it in any other way. And, and, and for him to sort of use the, the short film experience with Tilda Swinton, and then move into um, this experience with uh, Ethan and I, and Ethan 
talented guy. I saw The Explorers in the movie theater. Does anyone even know what that is? I've heard of The Explorers. I don't think I've ever it's seen like the it. It's like the realm though. of like, in the, the same wave of like the Goonies, you know? Yeah. My favorite movie of all time is Dead Poets Society. I saw Dead Poets Society yeah, in the, the movie theater. Yeah. And then I went to, you know, I started college and saw Reality Bites. And then he published a book. And then I saw him off Broadway and then on Broadway. And then I saw him direct the play. And the before uh, sunrise, before sunset, before midnight being my favorite um, movies are, again, another sort of authorship and rebellious kind of career refusing to limit it to any one thing. Also, shout out, he may win an Emmy this year, too, uh, for directing The Last Movie Stars, his documentary, which is... Which I got pristine. to watch while we were shooting uh, <laughs> the movie together. Yeah. So it was this highly magical experience in 117-degree temperature <laughs> in southern Spain. Um, <laughs> in um, beautiful, layered uh, Saint Laurent mm -hmm. costumes, yeah. but still with two legends kind of sandwiched between them and serving as sort of uh, a, a, a language interpreter as well. Pedro speaks mm. great yeah, English yeah, yeah. as much as he says that he doesn't. Yeah. Um, he plays it up. <laughs> he, gets, he gets by just fine yeah. with the English. And, um, and and so it was i couldn't have written it myself as far as the experience was concerned and also the feeling that it was to be listened to and to be um and for them to want to you know what i mean to be a colleague of these people a woman was found killed in town <laughs> You're doing this uh, film called Two Gladiator, Two Furious, right? That's what it's called? That's the working title? I call it Gladiator, Two Electric Boogaloo. Electric <laughs> Boogaloo. Um, I, I, with uh, Paul Mescal, which he's also a troublemaker, too good looking for his own good. Is he a to, troublemaker? He's just, like, you know, like, he's... Well, like, let's, like you, just let's like, take care of that. Yeah, we'll, we'll do, you, <laughs> talk to him on set for me and tell him that you have to, you know, bring him sit higher than him. Cut like the you shit, are. Paul Meskel. <laughs> yeah. When it got announced that you were in Gladiator Two, it said an unknown role, but Clayton Davis loves Walking Phoenix, uh -huh. and I see similarities in things between Pedro and Joaquin, and I was wondering. Not that you would answer this anyway. If you knew your, if you were willing to share what role you would be playing on in the film, because I have a you're theory. just you're just lubing me up. I'm just I'm just I'm asking what the people you are tell wondering. Me that, he, that I remind him of Joaquin Phoenix, so that I can literally get fired by Paramount by telling him, I'll be like, what? You think I'm like, His you think I'm like Joaquin Phoenix? Let me tell you everything. Here are the keys to my house. <laughs> um, well, we, we already said, I invited you over to spend Christmas. And you, <laughs> we can extend that. I have an extra room for you. Uh, but how excited are you to do that? And what are you willing to tell us about the picture? Um, I haven't, I haven't been put into a, in and under any instruction, but you know how scared we get in terms of misstepping on all this stuff. We, it's such a scary landscape to kind of navigate. Yeah. I used to, um, it, it's never caught, it's never caught up to me, but boy, not on a, not with a microphone in front of me or yeah. anything like that, but I definitely talked to an Uber driver about everything. Um, it's about all your Uber drivers. <laughs> we can get, we can piece it together. I remember being uh, in, uh, going, being in an Uber in London um, before starting uh, to shoot Wonder Woman, and um, and a, a very uh, conversational uh, Uber driver asking me what I was doing in London, and me telling him, and then gradually starting to explain the entire plot of Wonder Woman 1984. Um, and, 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 and realizing maybe I shouldn't, uh, maybe I shouldn't do that. But anyway, that being said, um, I think that I, I can only say that 
as we were talking about Almodovar, um, the idea of um, being on a set, but one of Ridley Scott's sets, three of his movies being in my top 10, and this is coming from a movie nerd. Um, I have to ask you which three. I have to ask you to guess. Thelma and Louise. Yes. Black Hawk Down. No. No. Gladiator. <laughs> I love it. Uh, I love it. Uh, I love Gladiator. I mean, I really uh, love the Blade movie. Blade Runner. You're a Blade Runner Blade guy Runner. for sure. Blade Runner. Dude. And Blade Aliens. Runner. Yes. Yeah, there you go. Well, take the uh, plural out of it. Oh. oh, Alien. Alien. Okay. He didn't direct Aliens. Oh, yeah. Clayton. I'm sorry. I, did, I, didn't, I knew this. I knew this. I misspoke. Don't my let bad. me down. My, my let bad. Me down. My bad. Yes. Uh, so Alien, Blade Runner, and Thelma and Louise. Yeah. That being said, I uh, would kind of play anything. <laughs> okay. So long story short, no, you're not telling us, but you're excited to work with Ridley Scott on this role that may or may not be just like Commodus. And Denzel Washington and uh, and Paul Meskel and um, and – you know, that is, again, stepping into or continuing to step into territory that feels like um, really exciting is such a pedestrian way of putting it. But I I don't know if I'll ever be able to kind of shed the identity of um, someone who was under the influence of these people for as long as I was specific to the, you know, late seventies, eighties, early nineties, in terms of my brain being a sponge and wanting to be on the screen or on the stage. And so, um, uh, it's kind of an, it's, it, it, it is a little bit of an awkward, uh, um, experience sometimes because yeah I'm, I'm invited to the table and I'm I and I've, I have a seat at the table and I and I deserve to be here but you know the <laughs> other part of me is like glitching out on imposter syndrome a little bit uh, t- c- imposter syndrome related and 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 just sort of like uh, 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 under the blanket of like admiration you know and I think that that's something worth coming into full acceptance of because I wouldn't be here if it weren't for those influences. And therefore, if that takes precedence over, or if that takes up the space of like where I'm supposed to um, uh, feel entitled to be there, then uh, fine, you know? I get it. And last question, we have to call you out on something because then, 2020, October 2020, you were on the cover of Variety. Yes. And a wonderful story written by my colleague, Adam Barry. Yes. And in said story, you said you were offered Wonder Woman 1984, and you said that will never happen again. (laughs) Fast forward to May 2023. You lied (laughs) to Adam Barry and the rest of us because you have been offered many roles Long in not in, in the same way in in the streamlined sense of you are you're riding a wave of star power admiration what, what you say Denzel Paul Meskel really Scott you know Ethan Hawke what Pedro meant to you you're you're meaning a lot to a lot of other people I don't know if you've taken that part in quite yet all right I'm not going to argue mm-hmm. with you. Mm-hmm. But what does it feel like to have that statement be wrong? Have you be so wrong in October there's, 2020? I think, you know, there's something in me that is, I think I could have been a good trial lawyer because all I want to do is argue your point <laughs> and be like, technically, I'm not wrong. Uh. Because what I meant was <laughs> the way I was offered uh, Wonder Woman um, is still sort of uh, hasn't happened in that it just seemed like at the time, it seemed like at the time I didn't, like a gift, like a real just here you go, we'll which word. seemed crazy to me. Well, um, word semantic, it. that's, there, fine. <laughs> that's fine, that's fine, that's <laughs> fine. But um, 
I want to be able to fulfill the assignment, you know, um, and continue fulfilling the assignment because um, that is uh, the, 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 the best part. Uh, it's not about necessarily getting an A, but it's definitely an anchoring thing in terms of um, understanding someone's vision, especially if it's somebody that you've, whose influence you've been under for so long. Yeah. And also um, fulfilling the role of like scene partner for somebody who is super impressive, and um, and if it if it comes with actually inspiring somebody else, that maybe that's the component that I'm kind of like unwilling to recognize because it can make my. I, I, I see the body language. I feel like it, you can't even. It can just kind of yeah. make my heart explode a little yeah. bit. Yeah. Because I suppose that, like, to think, you know, because I needed all of this, you know, not this work, but I needed it growing up. I needed yeah. the movies and I needed these directors and I needed these performances. And um, I, 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 I grew up very lucky and very privileged. But, um, but, but my, my heart and my imagination, you know. I, 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 it wasn't simply an interest, it was an identity and I needed it. Therefore, to even entertain a little bit that I could mean that, I don't, I, that I could mean that to somebody, that is um, very, like, it, it borders on, like, being emotionally a little over, over, it's, it's very moving. And um, I should, yeah. But congratulations anyway. So we're going to wrap up our time here. But what I want you to say, because uh, now we have a plan, is uh, to look into the camera and tell Mrs. Davis what your uh, menu, your dream menu for Christmas is. What do you, if you can build your, if Christmas Day, well, this is, meal. I want to play to people's strengths. Where's Mrs. Davis from? I mean, she's Cuban and Puerto Rican. I'll take that. <laughs> Mrs. Davis, I'll take some, I'll take some home cooked Take me to the islands. Ooh. Some, you're okay with uh, arabo and uh, rocangandule? Pero claro que sí. Eh, there you go.